Welcome everyone to Drawn to Figures. My name is Irina and I work with Jill at the National Portrait Gallery. And although we are gathering today from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. So I just wanna go over a few reminders before we get started. First, please keep yourself on mute throughout the program. This will ensure that everyone can hear Jill clearly, but if you do have any questions and we encourage questions or comments or tips, please feel free to leave them in the chat and we will answer as many questions as we can. And I will pass it back to Jill to start the program. Okay, good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. I'm having so many technical problems today, but we're going to be fine from this moment forward. I've given up on my AirPods. That might have been part of it. I don't know what's going on. Regardless, welcome everybody. It's so nice to see all of your faces from all over the world. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about um, palette knives today and palette knives. Now, um, palette knives are um, something that you'll use in several different ways. Um, so First of all, let, let me just show you. I have, I'm going to go on my document camera. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth between the document camera and ooh. Joe. Yeah. It's a little, um, there's like white noise in front of your um, voice. I don't know why. Let me, see. Well, let me try these with your ear pods and see if that helps it. Let me grab my other headphone set. One second. Okay. Sounds like someone filling up a bathtub. <laughs> it does. It's not. <laughs> it's. Crazy. Do you have a fan on? It doesn't. Or no, it's just the computer. Hmm. All right, you know what, Irina, let me just, yeah. everybody hold time for one second. I'm going to sign out and sign back in. Sometimes that's what part of the problem is. Okay. So I hate we to do that to everybody. Okay. Just give me okay. one second. Okay, good time. All right. Well, okay. So if everyone can keep muted, maybe, maybe the sound was not coming from Jill. Is, is that better? Yes. Okay. So let's see when Jill comes back on, if that is better. Sorry, everyone, for the delay. Just want to make sure that we can hear Jill better. Um, hope everyone is having a good week. Oh my gosh, I think this is so much better. <clears throat> it is. <laughs> I thought so too. I can already hear you better. Okay, sorry. Thank you for being patient with that. Uh, and I hopefully won't yank this, this ear, ear things right out of my head, but we're going to go with it. All right, so let's get back to talking. So I was about to talk to you all about palette knives. And, um, and this is something that I found over the years of teaching that some people either love or they absolutely hate it. And the reason is because in the beginning, when you first start using palette knives, you feel a bit like a kindergartner in that you have very little control over the, um, the results in the beginning. But as you work with them more and more, uh, it gets easier and easier. And, and I, I honestly don't do a single painting. I primarily use brushes, but my knives are always right here because there's just a time when you need to use a knife to get a certain effect. Or uh, I'm, I've learned through my years of study that it, it really is the best way to get some good true colors down um, and um, pure colors without dilution or spreading, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a skill that you should absolutely as artists learn and practice, uh, especially if you're new to color mixing. So before we get into that too much, let me just show you with my document camera again. 
um, what the differences are. I mean, will you make me a co-host again? Am I ready? There we go. Okay. Uh, here we go. So I'm going to my document camera now, which is going to be my desktop. Uh, and so I was surprised when I got all my knives out how many I have. So there's a difference between all these different kinds of knives. And I'll be honest, I'm still learning some of them and I use them all probably the way I'm supposed to and the way I'm not supposed to. Look, this one's got oil paint on it from yesterday. I was working with it. Um, and that's how you clean a palette knife, just like this. Uh, but look, this paint was on here since yesterday and I can get my knife completely clean, which is one of the best parts about palette knives is the ease of cleaning. So now that paint, of course, is everywhere. This is how I get covered in paint. I should have my apron on. Um, so anyway, there's two different kinds of knives. There's a palette knife um, that's used for uh, kind of mixing colors like this one. So you can paint with all of these knives, but some of them are definitely better for just plain old mixing colors on your palette. And some of them are better for painting like this one. This would be um, torturous to paint mix colors with because it would just take forever. Some of them you'll find too are more slanted than others. So when I'm saying slanted, see how this has got an angle to it, like a trowel? And some of them are completely flat or even less slanted. Um, so the ones that are less flat typically are used for just mixing colors. Um, and so you can, like I said, there's, you're always in art, in the art world, going to get lots of rules about what you should and shouldn't do with all of your tools. And the reason why you have those rules is because the, the instruments and the, the mediums are made to be used in a certain way. But that being said, it doesn't mean that you can't break all those rules. I would recommend always with every new medium you try or every new tool you try, learn how to use it properly first and then start changing the rules and see what you can get it to do. That's the only way you're gonna find new things. There's really just no rules. And so I encourage you to try and play with everything. Um, so the palette knife is definitely part of that, um, part of that lesson. Okay, I'm gonna come off of this for a second. I'll start talking to you again. Okay, so I have um, a series of things I wanted to tell you about, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna talk in like 15 minute increments. Um, and then we're going to stop and answer any questions that you have in the chat and then we'll keep going. Uh, and so if you have paints out, we are going to paint and I'm just going to show you how to use these knives. Um, if you want to try them or um, this is being recorded so you can go back over it again and then try this on your own time as well. Um, so either way works, but um, th the goal today is to get you to, to figure out how to use the knife and then I'm going to give you a really good lesson to practice them on your own time um, and the way I was taught to practice them that will help with your color mixing. Okay, so um, I, as you noticed, that my uh, knives were all metal. I have a plastic set here that I use with students, especially younger ones, because um, they don't necessarily need to use the, the heavy duty ones or the metal ones that are basically steel. But if you have these at home, these are fine. They will work just fine. The difference is, and what I like better about the metal edged ones is that they're going to be, uh, there's a spring to it and there's a hard edge to it, like a really hard edge. And sometimes that's what you're looking for with the knife. So it depends on what you're gonna use them for, but if you're just practicing or starting out, these are fine. I've actually seen some in wood as well, which are really a whole nother ball game, but the plastic ones are fine. This is what we have at the portrait gallery studio, the plastic ones, for, because we're just making practice art. If you're gonna take it further, then I would get a metal set. And honestly, you don't need as many as I have. I, was, uh, I think I have this many, mostly because people keep handing down supplies after they decide they didn't like them. And so I get, they get hand them off to me and I'll always take them because I love them. Okay, so um, when we talk about the blades and the different kinds of blades, um, there's different size. So there's really a tiny one, which I showed you earlier, like this one, I'm gonna put it in front of my shirt because my shirt's black and you can see it well. It's really small. This one I use a lot because by the when I'm looking to make a texture in my painting, this is the one I wanna use. You're only gonna use these small guys for detail work in small spaces when you're trying to make a certain texture. There's medium sized ones. Um, I tend to use these when I'm trying to get a lot of space covered quickly um, and more for a, a flat surface. So let me just even show you right away. I'm gonna go to, back to my document camera. We'll be flipping back and forth. And I just yanked my palette out of the freezer. So I've been I'm working a lot lately with my frozen palette. Um, I, I freeze my palettes overnight when I'm done with my paint and I'm not ready to throw them out or I'm, I'm the palette was just looking good. Here's my palette. 
I will pull it, I'll just throw it in the freezer overnight and then you can pull it back out and work with it. Um, I love the paint right after it comes out of the, the freezer because it's got this nice stiff, it's not too mushy yet, but it's got a nice texture to it. So look how great that is. You can see the texture of the paper. This is a, this is a canvas paper through the, um, through the paint, which I love. So this is a bigger blade and I'm using that to spread it across a bigger surface area. Uh, I like, and the reason why that's important is because uh, when you're working on a painting, let me see if you can see over my shoulder. Um, let me come back to here for a second. We're gonna let this dry because I'm gonna keep working on this one space. Let me get it nice and tidy though. So that's that one. Uh, also this one, you could do the same thing with. This is more of an edger though, so you can get a nice fine edge and scrape off. Um, I rarely use this one, but that's, um, that's a great one for covering paints. And then this one. So these are my two favorite medium sized ones. This large one would be used for the same way, but I technically, I generally use these bigger ones just for mixing. And this one, you can kind of see this one I use for, so sometimes I'll keep a knife like this one when I'm going to mix grout or some kind of medium that's going to get hard just because it's been a bit abused knife. So I'm not worried about it being perfect. You want to keep the, the reason why is because I want to keep the ones that I'm going to use for mixing really clean with nice clean edges so that I can get them to work for me. Um, okay, so let me stop sharing for one second. Um, I, so the, the sometimes when we talk about mixing um, colors and wanting to cover big spaces, um, paintings should start off with, um, and I'm, if, you're, if you have me pinned or just go to speaker view on your view, you'll be able to see it well over my shoulder is a new painting I'm just starting. And it's, um, it's a beaver. <laughs> I'll spotlight me for everyone just for now. So I start with this quick loose drawing of the, the beaver. And then you can see down here on the bottom is a giraffe. And so I'll fill in the whole canvas with color first. I find when you're mixing colors and making paintings, there's an apple also back here I'm working on, um, that it's best to get the whole canvas covered with color so that you can make good decisions about how you're mixing color. If you have big white spaces on your canvas, it's sometimes hard to compare and contrast whether you wanna change your colors. So the palette knife is a great way to fill this background in. I've, I've done a quick sketch of this guy with a loose wash of oil, a turpentine wash, and now I'm letting him dry and then I'll cover the whole canvas with color and just block it in, that's called blocking, which we're gonna talk about in the future. But that's basically what that looks like. Okay, so that's what those the different kinds of knives are. So again, to clean the knife, you just take this and clean it off. This is really one of the best, I mean, the best parts about palette knife painting is that the cleaning is done in two seconds flat. Um, okay, so uh, as we mentioned, the rounded blades, and see what this is what happens. I said that green was on that palette knife from before, and now it's everywhere. You got to keep everything tidy or you're going to get all over you. Uh, so you will use these knives primarily for oils and acrylics, your thicker paints, because you're looking for a texture, you're spreading them. You can, and I've seen people use them with watercolors, um, and in that case you're doing a lot of um, uh, scra scraping or pushing of, of the color around. And again, if you have the, the more texture you have to whatever surface you're using, whether it's a canvas and the different kinds of canvases in the duck or linen or whatever kind you're using, or and, and paper, the watercolor paper has different kinds of textures to it, the more you'll get out of the knife and getting um, this, this textured effect. So uh, again, you can use them with all kinds of mediums, but primarily oils and um, acrylics. Um, and that's basically uh, when you're painting with them thickly, here, let me go to my, my PowerPoint really quickly, just to show you an example, obviously our most famous um, uh, artists who've used these in the past, presentation mode. For those of you who don't know, this is the National Portrait Gallery. Look at me backtracking really quickly. This is the National Portrait Gallery. We're part of Smithsonian. And so um, obviously we're closed right now, but you can access our website, which has I think we have 25,000 portraits in our collection at this point. And so you can dig through those and, and use those as resources to practice with, and you should. Um, these are some various knives, but um, there's, um, impasto would be Vincent Van Gogh's kind of style. So impasto is when paint's laid down in these big thick layers and you're just dabbing it down and you're pulling it up. You could, I don't know that he used a knife with this particular painting, but this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about big thick layers and laying down big dots. 
of course, this is Cezanne and the same thing. I don't know for sure that he used a knife with this, but you could have recreated this painting with a knife. If you look up in the sky, do you see how there's big colors pulled down, almost like you'd see a knife or a big, huge brush pulling them down. So if you're going to practice copying and learning from other artists, I say this every time, you can copy all you want from other artists, but you can never pass it off as your own copy for practice only because you can learn a lot by getting into their paintings and learning about their range. You will see the art completely differently if you try to replicate it, um, but you can never pass it off as your own, obviously, that's cheating. Uh, and of course this one, oh my gosh, is that not beautiful? Um, so there's, impasto would be laying down huge thick layers of color. And so this is just one way to do it. That's to, that to being said, you don't have to paint thickly with palette knives, you can keep it thin but um, typically they're used for textures. Another technique is called sfraffrito. I always mess that word up, sfraffrito, which means you're scratching the surface. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. So don't worry about that for now. But I wanted to talk about um, just those two ideas of what we're looking at as far as like thickness of paint. Okay, so let me make sure I've got myself to a point. I should check my time. Irina, do you have any questions at this point or can I keep going? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Right. The first question is about cleaning your palette knives. What is the best way? Can you use a detergent or is it just regular paper towel? I just use a paper towel. But that being said, it, I can see by looking at a couple of my knives, I didn't do a very good job. There's some paint stuck on this one. And so I just get a sponge out um, with a little bit of a bristle to it, like a rough back to it and then just scrub it off. Um, you can use, if it's an oil paint, I mean, you can use different kinds of, um, cleaners, I guess, for sure. But that paint, you know, it's an enamel, it's stuck on there. So um, take care of your knives while they're good and clean. And then uh, because there's really no excuse not to, it just takes two seconds to take a paper towel across them. But if you have stuff stuck on them, try cleaning them off. I will say this, let me see if I can find the one. Um, I was just cleaning one the other day, and I cleaned a little too roughly, and I bent it. And so now I'm having a hard time, I think this is the one, getting it bent back. You can just use a little bent in the tip. It's making me nuts now because I can't get it to do what I want it to do. So be careful with your knives too, like don't bend them off. But I can really just take my fingernail and scrape off the paint. So um, it's, it's the super easy to clean, which I love. So if you're someone who doesn't have a whole lot of time to paint, and you wanna you know, keep your paints at a certain place and just quickly work on something and be able to put it away. Or if you don't have a great space for chemicals like turpentines, palette knives are, there, are for you because you can do them pretty quickly. And someone asked about keeping, you said you were keeping them in the freezer or you're keeping your paint in the freezer. Yeah, Which I keep one? my paint in the freezer. Because yeah, behind the beaver is a little tiny fridge that holds all my palettes. Um, and so I don't like to waste paint, number one. And um, uh, sometimes I'm working on something, like if I'm working on a figure and I've got the skin tones mixed up just the way I like them, um, I'll just freeze the whole palette and then pick, pick the palette out the next day and I can pick up right where I left off. But I will say that you can't like, right now this palette has some mixed spaces in the middle. These, these spaces are probably gonna get dry pretty quickly if they're frozen. So um, you, you can't always, I and mean, I can freeze them for a couple of days, but they dry out. And then you have a huge, over in my sink, which you can't see, thank goodness, there's stacks of palettes that I need to scrub and clean. And you're using acrylic paint today, right? I'm using oil today. Oh, oil today. Can you use acrylic and Absolutely. oil and watercolor? Yes, you can, and, but I wouldn't use, you can use them together. So the rule with uh, mixing paints together is fat over thin. So if you're gonna paint, you can paint watercolor down and acrylic down, let it dry completely, and you could put oil over top of it, but you can't go the other way. Unless you uh, varnish it heavily, the oil, and then you can go on top of the varnish if the varnish can take it. But um, the rule of paints as a rule, this is fat over thin. Oils over any kind of water base. Great. And um, one more question I think we have time for. Um, where, like, when would you suggest starting with palette knives? Like, do you start early or later in, in your, your work? Day. Now, <laughs> like today. <laughs> when we hang up, I want you to go get your knives out and practice. I'm going to give you a lesson to give you a start, to give you a, get you started on it. Um, but yeah, I would say I, I usually, so like with the beaver, now that he's drawn on, I'm gonna get my palette knives out and cover him in blocks, block it out. And then I'm gonna let it dry. And then I'm gonna build up over top of that with my brushes. But that doesn't mean I might not go back in with my knives in a little bit. Let me share my screen really quickly. I'll show you one more thing that will answer that question better too. And that's okay, because it's all part of our talk. Um, 
I'll show you an example of when I use my palette knife. Let's see if I have it on here. There it is. This is a video I had to do for somebody who was buying a, well, I didn't have to do it. I did it for um, a, a biography someone was doing, but um, I just happened to find this. And I just, the other day I was, this paint, someone's looking at buying this painting. So I was just showing them some texture. But uh, this is a grilled cheese sandwich. So I paint food <laughs> a lot and I really, they wanted the cheese to feel like it was dripping down and smooth and, and like hanging off and, and globbing. And so I used a brush over here. You can see my strokes on the bread, but I felt like the cheese area just needed a knife. And so I got the knife out to do that. Um, so that's just an example of when you would feel like that would be a good thing to do, the cheese. And so I, I pull, I use, I use both of them. I use my knife and my brushes all the time in both of my, my, um, in my, in my work. Okay, there's, so can you keep the oil and the acrylic in the freezer? Yeah, I have yeah, both my oils work. and my acrylics in there. Watercolor palettes, you can just let dry up and then you can just reconstitute that watercolor with, with uh, water. Um, but the acrylics will dry faster in that freezer. So like if I have a, a choice between the freezer section and the, fr the fridge section, put your acrylics in the freezer first because they, they'll, do, they'll last longer frozen. Um, but I, I keep everything in the fridge at least. And then, um, but I prefer the freezer for sure. I keep the fridge really cold. And so we got this in my studio because I was storing them in my house freezer and it was just, it was getting everywhere. So my husband bought me that. And so now I've got racks of freeze pallets in there for freezing. If it's cold outside, we used to take lessons as a group at, at a, uh, the um, Eggly's, uh, the Cedric Eggly and Jonah Eggly had a great barn and we would go in the winter to take classes. It was freezing outside and we just put our pallets out on the porch and then come back the next day and bring them back in and keep working as a workshop. Okay, any more questions before I move on? This is fine. There was one more about whether you cover with the beaver painting, whether you cover, you block it around the beaver or you do the whole thing with a palette knife and then go in for detail. Um, I'll block, I'll do the whole thing with a palette knife. Um, I probably won't, yeah, I'll do, I'll block the whole thing with a palette knife, the background and the beaver himself. And that's an apple on his head because this is a commission for a hotel in New York City. They're going to put it by their uh, concierge desk. So um, he's going to have a big apple on his head and this apple as well. So I will cover this whole thing with a dark brown and then maybe a lighter brown under his feet, light it up, and then I'll block all of him in, and then I'll let it dry completely, and then I'll get to work. What you're doing when you block with this giraffe is even easier to see, is you're, you're, you're taking something that's complicated, a beaver with an apple on his head that's got lots of information in his fur and, and in the apple, and you have to break it down to the simplest forms first line like a line drawing and then you block in the basic colors you're not trying to get any eyeballs or nose or anything at that point you're just putting in spaces of color and then you're adding a new layer of information and a new layer of information all the way down to like the last little hairs and the little white of his eye but that's you don't just jump in with the white of the eye you have to start back to the very simplest that's your job as an artist is to see things in the simplest way first and then slowly add layers and build the idea up. it can't get beautiful or finished before it's ready to be finished and beautiful. Or you'll always be making, fixing and, and, and being, being crushed because you have to go back and fix something that, that you've finished already. And it's not done until it's totally done and signed. And you need to be willing to change any part of your painting right up until that moment. And so you're better off really just making sure um, that you work from the very simple objects to the very detailed and get comfortable with that. And I gotta tell you, these palette knives are a great way to do that because it forces you to be simple. Um, so let me keep going. Okay. So uh, let's go back to my document camera and I'm going to talk you through just a couple different ways to use these knives and, um, and then we'll stop again and, and we'll draw or we'll, we'll ask answer questions. So the first way is the layers of color, which I just laid down that one layer of color. The nice thing about palette knives is you cannot, um, number one, you cannot dilute them with turpentine. A lot of times with our watercolors or our acrylics or with our oils, we'll dilute with turpentine or water to thin the paint down. You will not be doing that with oils. You're going to put the color straight onto the canvas. And the reason why that's a good thing is because uh, in, in learning how to mix colors and learning about colors and in even blocking out your paintings, you want rich, vibrant colors, the true colors out of the tube, so you can learn how to mix well. So uh, I know that's, that's kind of a complicated thought, but I'll get to that in a minute. But um, if you're going to go over this, this piece now, oh, that's a sticky one, let me pick this color. 
sometimes my paints are a little old and they're sticky and I go over top of this, you can go right over top of that and I have a true color. So one of the techniques is to just loosely, I'm very, I laid the painting, I loaded the back of my knife with paint. Here, let me leave these knives over here for a second and then I'll move my palettes in view so you can see that well. I've got my loaded desk here. I've got so much to show you today. Okay, here's my, here's my palette knife, my palette. So I loaded the back and I'm laying it down flat gently and I'm just pulling that across and I'm covering that paint, uh, that, that basic paint color on the bottom. Uh, the lighter I am, the more of the texture or pockets of color will come through. This is that Seth Grito was talking about earlier when you see these pockets of color coming through. And so it's very intentional that I want that to come through. You can also use your tip and drag it out and make lines like that. So this paint on the bottom is certainly not dry, it's an oil, but I can, if I had a brush, I would have pulled up some of that yellow into this purple color. Um, and so it's not, it looks like a black, I think on your picture, but it's definitely a purple. But because I have a knife, I can lay that color right over top without picking up that other color. So that's a really great technique. That's just one of them. I can take my edge and pull off and I can lay more down again. Your, the weight and how much you're pressing down will have a lot to do with the effect that you're getting. And then when I'm ready to change colors, you just wipe it off. This is the other thing that's great about when it comes to mixing. If I had my brush, I would have had to make sure my brush was thoroughly cleaned before I mixed a new color because you would have had some of the old color in your brush and it would have changed your mixing. And if you're learning how to mix, you want the colors to be true. Um, and, and also you go through a lot of paint the other way. You end up just like cleaning all the, your brush out and you're getting rid of paint, get over and over and over again. So layers of color. Uh, you can also just pick like, let me pick another color here. This is a color I have. This is, this is that was purple. This is a nice pink. Oh no, this is a, a, these are in a red. You can put dabs of color down. You could put long sweeps of color and you can make lines of color. So to make a line, this is another great red. Um, you could get, I loaded the back of my knife and I could put my knife right straight down and I could just make a nice straight line. Then you can lay it flat, come back. You can make all kinds of fans. I mean, you can play with it a lot, but in the beginning, it feels like you have no control over what you're doing because it's just, it's such a weird thing. I've, uh, and I say that some of you will absolutely have not that problem at all, but I've watched so many people get frustrated with knives because they can't control them well. Um, and that is kind of the point. So here's a flesh tone for you. Let me, let me show you. If I go with my, uh, my alizarin red, which goes a long way. Um, let me get rid of that, that stuff off. I like a nice cad yellow mixed in with that. Let me get it over here. That doesn't seem like a good flesh yet, but hang on. There's that. And now I'm gonna bring a white in and it should come to a flesh tone depending on how much white you have. And there's a kind of a nice flesh tone. This um, document camera sometimes, and I light this so I can see it well, but that might be better. Let me lower my other light. That's a little better. So you're getting flesh tones. And so here's what I wanted to show you that for, um, because I mixed all of my colors here, not on my palette, on my canvas. And that is the beauty of palette knives. But I will tell you, there's a little bit of a learning curve there. It's intimidating to bring all your colors on there. But I was able to say to myself, okay, I made this color that's, I could say that's too uh, yellow and I'll add a little more red in. And then I could say, okay, now I've got it too red. Let me come back with a touch more yellow. And so I'm mixing it right on my canvas rather than mixing it over here on my palette and bringing it back and forth and back and forth and wondering and questioning. You go through a lot of paint if you leave it all on your palette. You bring it right to your canvas and you work there. Because you're questioning, is this better than this? Is this closer? Which one's closer, this one or this one? And so then you add a little more of what? And so the, the conversation you're having in your brain is, um, is it too hot, too cold, too dark, too light, too deep, to bright. The difference between, and I say this all the time, the deep and dark is black. Black or dark brown or Van Dyke brown will just make your colors darker, but not deeper. And there's a difference when that comes to hue and you want things to be usually deeper and not darker. So black is something that you would use very carefully, if at all, when learning how to mix colors. 
um, light and bright rather than adding white to something. White will make something lighter, but not brighter. So maybe a yellow might make something brighter. And so you, you know, there's a, there's a million ways to mix colors, as many colors as there are in ways you can think of. But the only way you're going to learn them is to start. Okay, so let me make sure I got the lines. I talked about that one. Um, patches I talked about. I love this. You can, as this dries, you can take on, pull it up and do a little more scumbling and um, scruffing of it. You can take now maybe a third color. Let me grab some green and lay that over top of that. And you can leave. Now, see, I paint like butter. Let me get that closer. See it better. So I like to paint like butter. And, and a palette knife in your mind, a lot of ways you are painting like butter or icing a cake. But I love this texture. So leaving that texture on there for me and the, 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 with the themes that I work in with foods and things like cupcakes and things like that, this is perfect. I'm like literally icing with my, my cakes with this paint and leaving that way. That texture will dry like that. And that's what I want. So don't be afraid to paint like butter. Now, when you do paint like butter, it can take months, even up to a year for your paintings to dry completely. So um, either if I have a commission and I'm painting like butter, I will hang it and say, you cannot touch it. And I have actually had to go back and repair a few things because people bumped into them, um, but you, or you can keep it in your studio, um, but it, it takes a long time for them to dry to the point where you can varnish, which is which, what, you, what you put on to finish, the, to finish the painting to protect it. Um, if you're going to varnish it all. This is kind of even just beautiful. It just it, sometimes just getting the paints out and just playing and seeing what you make. And you know what, you're going to feel like you want to go really fast. Take your time. Just play with the colors and see what happens. Uh, last week when we were here, I shared with you my color chart for flesh tones. Um, you can make all of those flesh tones. That's a great lesson to do with this knife. Make them with the knife and then lay them out and play with them. So the two things I wanna make sure you understand what I just said is you should mix your colors on your canvas, not over here with your palette knife. That's the point of learning how to mix because you're, it's a constant conversation about what I'm doing. And the knife is the best way to do that because you're getting pigment straight down and you're getting a true mix of the colors without a brush um, muddling it or making it muddy. If you go with a brush, sometimes you, you keep adding more color and adding more color and there's color left over from the last thing you did and it gets muddy quickly. Um, but the, the palette knife is the best way to make those kinds of mixtures. Okay, let me make, see if I got all my, my techniques out. How am I doing on my time here? Okay, good, I'm good. All right, um, so let me see. I mean, do I have any questions before I move forward? Yeah, there are a few. Um, the first is, are there any palette knives that you would not recommend using? I haven't come across any that I don't love. I, I almost never use the plastic ones in my studio. Um, and, and just strictly because I've really become accustomed to this fine, hard edge. I can pull a plastic one out and show you the difference. Okay, that one's pretty cruddy, that's embarrassing. Let me pull this one out, okay. Like they have, they have a, good, a good edge, but it's just not quite the same. This is like a metal edge, obviously. This one's just a teeny bit thicker. The, they're also, there's a little, these, these knives are a little firmer and these are a little too, too bouncy for me. I'm very particular about my knives and my brushes and the spring they give me back. I like a little bit of firmness, but not too firm. I can't stand when something flops. It just, I feel like I'm just pushing up, making a big mess. I don't like that at all. So I like the, the bounce that I have in these, these guys too. Any more, Irina? Keep them coming. Yes. Um, is what you're painting now, would that be considered um, a la prima painting, like wet on wet? Yeah, well, a la prima is wet on wet, but you don't have to use knives to do that. So yes, um, wet on wet is a la prima. And, um, but you don't, knives aren't all, the only way to make a la prima. You can make a la prima with brushes, but it just takes some skill. Um, we talked about this, I think in another class, but there's an artist and we did a whole show with her at the portrait gallery named Rose Franson, who I am a huge fan of. Um, Rose Franson, she did an exhibit for us called Makokata. And she sat down and did two hour painting sessions. I can't remember if it was two hours, maybe just a few hours of painting sessions with the people within her community that was free. They had to sign up and they could just come in and sit down and she paints a la prima and she is so good. Um, actually last week when we talked about um, practicing flesh tones and I showed you that book where I laid that plastic over top of the book and when we practiced the flesh tones on the plastic, that was her book. I keep it close by 
as inspiration. I don't paint in her way, but I learn a lot about how she paints. And so speaking of that, I learned block studies and which we're gonna talk about in a second. And my, I learned how to mix colors in my colors, which I'm still learning and I'll always be learning, but I learned them from impressionist teachers. The impressionists have colors like they don't know how to mix colors like nobody else. <laughs> and they're just, so, I, I like the way they mix colors. They're bold and they're bright. So I study impressionist painting to learn about mixing colors, but I don't paint like that at all. But that doesn't mean you should, you can't learn from that. So it, as you're practicing, try different kinds of art because you will learn from different people, different things. Okay, any more? Yes, um, can you just repeat the name of the book and the, um, the okay. author? Rose Franzen, it's spelled F-R-A-N-T-Z-E-N. There's, um, when in, at, when, aside from these live sessions, we have a YouTube channel that has a lot of lessons on it. And I did a whole flesh tone video based on her work uh, under drawn to figures. So you'll have to, um, I'm not sure, I know those open studios are sectioned off, um, but the drawn to figures, so those two different kinds of videos, open studios, which are primarily for children, but, but you can learn a lot from them too. And I love doing them. Um, but, and also drawn to figures, which are a little more advanced. They aren't sectioned off in the same way, but just search through and you can look for them or just look at the Rose France and or flesh tone videos. There's yeah, two and I'll put, videos. I'll oh. put the link in the chat for yeah. everyone to go there. Um, and then two more quick questions. What colors would you recommend having on your palette? And what's the best way to um, make your paint dry more quickly? Okay, good. So there's, there's two easy ways to answer that. The first one for the first question is, um, and so here's what I see a lot of people do. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you, this will take me into the next um, segment. So maybe hold that one. What was the second question again? It was, how can you make your paint dry more quickly? Can oh, you use okay. a hair dryer? Yeah, not well, with acrylics, yes. Oils, no. Uh, oils, there are uh, some kind of fast drying oils, which I would use with caution. I use them when I am desperate. I'm, I gotta get something out the door. Um, you can use those, but boy, they dry fast. Um, I found the water, there's a, there's a water-based oil paint, believe it or not, that's out on the market. Um, I find that they dry more quickly and there's other mediums like an oil medium you can put in to make your paints dry faster. There's also a couple of varnishes you can spray down that make them dry faster. I have used those when I had to hang something in a show, but I have to say, I didn't love it. If you can avoid using those, I would. I felt like they left a weird speckly, as much as I shook that can and tried to keep the, the, the look of it clean, it just didn't work out well. So I have found, I have a wood stove in my house and my husband has built me a rack beside those that if I build a wood, fi wood fire and then I line up my paintings there, they dry overnight <laughs> pretty quickly. So if you have a wood stove or a fireplace, you can do that. Do not put them in your oven, that would be unsafe. But I have a wood stove where they get kind of like a radiant heat. So put them near your heater. Uh, oils just take a long time to dry. So you have to kind of build that in. Like I have a show coming up in May and I've got things drying all around me. So it just, just takes that time. Um, so back to the, the, before I go to the next question though about what colors to use, is there another one? Any more questions? Um, I think uh, there was some chat about flesh tones and whether you just use primary colors or you can use like the whites that you use today okay, or what's perfect. the best method. That kind of leads me into the next idea anyway. So here's what I wanna tell you to do. And this is how I learned flesh tones. And mind you, I'm, I will be learning as an artist, I, I've got good news for all of you. You will be students all of your life. You will never learn everything and you will always be learning from others. And that's the best part about being an artist. So embrace it. Um, and one of the things that you'll always be learning from is, is mixing colors. Um, and there's, um, a lot of artists who are doing really interesting things with mixing their colors. There's two videos on that YouTube channel. One is like very standard colors and the one it, it focuses on artists that use all kinds of colors within their flesh tones. So Michael Vazquez is one of them. I just love his art. And then Beverly McIver is another one. Those are both uh, artists who were recently in our portrait competition and they're contemporary, they're making art now, but those are two great artists to look up for really interesting work with flesh tones. But um, to answer your question, um, uh, I use, so here's how I learned color. I learned color studies. Let me go off my share for one second. And this is what your assignment is gonna be. Stop share, here we go. Okay, back to me. So these are blocks that I have. I have a lot of these in my studio. And so I just found these at Home Depot and then I painted them 
just random colors. I tried to stick as kind of clo close to flesh colors as possible, but not perfectly. You will take these blocks and you will lay them down on your table and you will paint them and you'll light it. And the reason is this, this block the whole way around or even this one, they're all the same. Oh, that's got paint on it, of course. All the way around is the same color. I painted the whole block the same color, but even as I hold it here, you can see that you can't use the same color to make this one as to make this side as to make this side. So you must mix. And so you will take these blocks, you will stack them up and you'll, you'll paint them just like this. You might do two at a time if you feel like it, maybe just start with one. If you're really brave, paint one white and then paint it because you cannot just use white to make that white block. There's three different sides here. So you must mix the colors to find those. And so that is, that is how you learn how to mix. You have to figure out what you need to do to make this one look like this one. I can see this one has more purple and red in it. And this one has more yellow in it. This one probably has a touch more blue in it. I can see a cerulean blue in here. I can see um, maybe a lemon here. Over here, I see a lot of dioxide and I see a lot of um, a red, like a pr Prussian, um, uh, a permanent pink rose. And so you begin to see, like I remember the first time I did this class, I had uh, a, something like this and, and uh, I was taking the class and the teacher walked up, she was, oh, I can see all the paints you need to make that. And then she walked away and I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm not, what am I gonna do? How am I supposed to figure this out? But it, I kind of just sat there and, and you could begin to quit, ask yourself the right questions. What do I, is this too dark? It's too dark. What do I need to do? And you will have a hard time at first, but you'll start, start to get it. So you set these up. And, and on a setting, they can make a still life and then paint them in the morning and then come back, make, find natural light if you can, paint them in the afternoon and then come back and paint them in the evening in the different kinds of sunlight. And you will learn so much about color mixing and do it with your palette knife because if you're, you'll be messing around with your brush and you'll be always kind of recleaning and recleaning and recleaning. That is a really great way. And so to answer your question about the, what colors do you need, um, I find that so many new students go to the tube to think that there's like a flesh tone tube. Um, and that might apply to like one little piece of a person's skin, but nowhere else. You will never be able just to use one color right out of a tube. You have to learn how to mix eventually. And so just diving in and doing it. You can start, and I would say start simply, pick one block with one color um, and start with your primaries and see if you can add from there. And the reason is this, like there's a million different kinds of greens, a million different kinds of reds and yellows and so on. And they will all do different things. Uh, I found uh, for me, I simplified my palette down to, and actually my teacher did it for me. I had this palette. It looked a lot like the palette I have in front of me today. And he came over and took his knife and just scraped all the paints off, but like two or three and threw them out. Oh my gosh, it was so much money. I could see the dollar signs going straight into the garbage can. But his point was you are complicating your learning process by putting every color in the world on your palette. Start with three or four, pick a green, pick a yellow, pick a blue and pick a red or something like that, or pick, pick your primaries um, and note which ones you're using because with oil paints and with acrylic paints, the metals in the paints do different things when you mix them with each other. Um, a great lesson I should look into doing this would be to say um, like a white with different kinds of reds will show you exactly how those paints are so completely different. Red is really one of the trickiest paints to use um, mainly because of the metals in it and it changes overnight. You'll make a painting like this. The reason why this apple is sitting there is because I expect the colors to change overnight and I wanna see what I have the next day before I start working on it. Red's just like that. So, um, but each, each color has their different things. And so you, rather than trying to learn them all at once, just pick a few, learn, play with them a little bit and then add one, add a new color to the palette and try playing with that and add a new color to the palette and go on from there. Um, and then you'll slowly get to pick your favorites. Uh, and then once you get your favorites to keep yourself from getting into a rut of only using your favorites, every now and then just get something random. Like I, um, I, if you join a couple of the paint makers um, like uh, Windsor Newton, um, I know in particular, you can sign up to get samples sometimes sent to you. And so you get these little teeny packets, these little cellophane packets over their new colors or a random color that you've never used before. What a great way to experiment with colors. So every now and then in the mail, I'll get this great little packet of color. And I almost always end up buying the tubes because I love what I'm binding, but I never would have tried that color had I not done that because it, it, it's expensive to buy paints and you don't know what you're getting. And so, um, 
here, I also, I get a lot of paints from people who have decided they're done painting and they can't stand oils and they just drop the box off here, which is the best. I love that. So, um, or like sometimes you can find paints, oil paints don't really go bad. Like I still have some really old tubes in there. So you might find, unless they're not sealed well, you might find on eBay, like boxes of paints people are just throwing out and they want to get rid of them. Just get them and see what they do. Play with them a little bit. Or yard sales, oh my gosh. You can find some really good paints at yard sales. So people just said they hate, they, hate, they hate painting and they don't want to do it anymore. And you can pick them up there. And that's a nice way to experiment. That way you're not spending a fortune on all kinds of paints. If I were to recommend three to start, I would say cadmium yellow, medium. You know, they have light, medium, and dark. I would go with cadmium yellow, medium, um, alizarin crimson, sap green, and dioxin purple. Those are the four I would say. And then you have to get a white. And I would say titanium white. Um, and don't use black. The, I feel like black is something you can use later. And I do use a lot of black in my paintings, but very carefully and in little teeny spots. Instead, to make a great black, I would mix um, red, the red I just mentioned, the alizarin red. Um, I would use the dioxin purple and the sap green, make a really nice dark color. If you want to um, use a fallow blue, but fallow blue is inky. And, and I love that about it, but it it gets everywhere once you touch it. So um, use it with caution. I said titanium white because titanium white is of the whites is opaque. And so that means it will, it will hold well. The zincs, the flakes, they all have a little bit of more transparency to them. There's also something called a soft mixing white that you can use just to practice with. That would be fine. Those are the colors I would start with and then just start playing. You could, should be able to get a lot done with those colors and white. Uh, and you should be able to make lots of block studies. And use your knives, don't get, don't get panicky. And when you use your knives here, let me show you an example really quickly of a, a palette knife painting. It looks, it looks like, um, like this. This is not mine. I just, this, I'm not sure who this artist is, but I just grabbed this off the internet really quickly because my, I tried to find my block studies and I don't know where they are in this studio, they're somewhere. But this one, I just borrowed off the internet really quickly but to show you because I thought it was a pretty good, good example. It's, um, this is probably not even with a knife. This looks like I can see the strokes of brushwork, but this is what a block study looks like. Um, don't start with this many. I have, and I, I wouldn't start with a sphere. I have a couple of spheres in here too, but with a knife, that's tricky business or a cylinder even. Start with your simple shapes so you can get their edges, but it's not meant to look really um, finished and gorgeous. It's meant to look rough and um, scrapey. Um, if you look at, if you Google it, Henry Henschey, um, the people that I taught from studied under Henry Henshi, and he has some beautiful block studies. Um, and I, I heard a story once, my teacher told me a story once that they would come in um, during the day, they'd set up their, their, their block studies in the sun in the morning outside and paint that same study all day long as the light went up over them and down the other side. At the end of the day, they would throw their paintings in a bin, walk away and come back the next day and, and start with a whole new painting because the intention isn't to make a finished beautiful piece, it's to learn. So you're just making practice art. Don't get hung up on making it perfect. Just learn what you can. And so the knives are gonna help you with that because they can help you study and, and learn more quickly with, with color mixing. Um, but like I said, if you're gonna put texture in your work, if you wanna scrape, these are the best, these are a great tool to use. I, I have them by my table at all times. They're all over the place, really. Okay, any more questions? Because I've got, that's all I have for you for now, but. Let's get your questions and make sure um, I read on a few get they, if the sign up is ready for next the next round or not. Yes, it is ready, and I can put that in the chat. Um, can you just repeat the name of the green that you recommend? A sap green. Sap now, green. sap green in Windsor Newton. So I have found as I've mixed colors that some of these colors are different in different brands. I stick basically, I'm a Winsor Newton kind of girl, but that doesn't mean I have, I have, um, I like, there's a cheap brand of paint called Artist Loft. They make the most beautiful cerulean blue I've ever seen. So I only use Artist Loft cerulean blue, but I, I stick with student, if you're going to practice student grade, get student grade, don't get expensive stuff. Student grade um, Winsor Newton, I think it's called Winton um, paints are fine or any student grade will be fine. Have you, someone was asking, have you used those paints before? Which ones? Windsor Newtons? Yeah, when Windsor Newtons. Oh, oh yeah, I have, um, I could turn this a little bit. You can see like there's a cabinet behind the drafts. See that top drawer that's open? That's absolutely sagging. Those, that's completely full of oil paints. 
and the next drawer down is my acrylic paints next drawer down is my watercolor paints but that's um and then i have a bucket <laughs> i'll show you too well i have a bucket full of like empty paints that i keep on my tubes beside my skeleton yes and so i and i use basically i also use if i'm going to use oils i'll use a um just a regular um linseed oil nothing expensive um, don't make sure if you're picking up your oils, don't pick up the fast drying oil because it dries like it's fast. They're not kidding. And Windsor Newton makes that watercolor, that water um, based. Um, here's, here's, the, here's my cadmium yellow right beside my desk. I pretty much keep these, the cad yellow, that sap green and that crimson and the dots and purple is a must. Um, I use those pretty much exclusively in everything. I don't make a palette ever. Everything I paint has those colors in it. Those are my favorites. And then the white. Um, I've been using a lot of, um, and I also use Prussian rose, I mean, I'm sorry, permanent rose a whole lot. Permanent rose is a, fun, a favorite one. And um, I, I tend to lean on Van Dyke brown for, as a substitute for black because it's a little bit more re responsive to mixing. Sometimes I'll, I'll line up different colors of, of white. I'll use, I'll have a zinc white or a flake white and a titanium white because I want one to lighten and one to brighten. Um, and then, but I, I stick with titanium white. Try to keep your, your palette clean. Like don't, when, as you work, don't let your palette become a great big mess. Clean it up as you go, keep it tidy, especially your whites. So I have it, when I put my whites down, put like a long strip of white and I use one side for mixing. And then I only use the other side for when I need pure white. I don't touch that unless my palette, my everything's clean, then I just pull that from pure white. What else? Um, oh, I think maybe I think maybe we were also missing the name of the blue that you mentioned oh, that you um, would recommend. Okay, so there's two I would recommend, and uh, I I like blues. I, I play with blues a lot. I, I fallow blue I keep on my palette, but it's called it's P H A L O blue I believe, um, and there's and cerulean blue. Um, and I keep them both on my palette. Fallow blue is darker and inkier. Um, and cerulean obviously is light. And I like the artist's loft cerulean. Actually, and if you can get it in the tiny tubes, for some reason, the bigger tubes aren't the same. <laughs> They're just a little bit, they aren't mixed quite the same, but they're still good. But um, yeah, if you can't, if you can't find that one, any cerulean blue is fine. But for some reason that is just, when you mix that with white, it glows, practically glows. It's just beautiful. So, and I would recommend that as you're learning to mix, take a little bit of white with each of these colors first to see what happens. So you can get a feel for it. Um, and then you can um, start mixing from there, but you'll see how some of the colors like leap right off your palette when you mix a little white with them, which is so great. What else? Um, let's see. Um, someone is asking about um, Cobra oil paint. Would you recommend it? Have you used yeah, it? You, I have. I have some Cobras in my box. I have just about everything, and, and they're good too. Yep. I mean, have, I have some. Somebody must have bought a Bob Ross kit a million years ago, and I like a couple of those. Um, so I will never turn down paints, and all any anything you have is going to work great. I, I wouldn't just say Windsor Newton is the only one to use. I just happen to be. I'm not sure how I got started on these, but that's how I learned how to mix my colors. So I just stick with that because that's what I know. But I would be happy. I try all different kinds of paints. I mean, everything would work. Try them all. Um, I have some that have no labels at all. I've got a Utrecht brand in there is, as well. That's also good. Utrecht and Dick Blick are kind of the same. They, I think the Dick Blick bought Utrecht or something, maybe something like that. But um, anyway, I've got those. I wouldn't say no to any of them. I think that because paints are vary just a little bit within their different brands, um, I, it's hard to kind of sometimes learn what your paint's going to do. And, and so I'm com comfortable with what I know, um, but I would say all of them work. And the difference between, we've talked about this in the past, but I'll say it again, between student grade and professional grade is, isn't so much that one is better than the other one. There's a slight difference in the mix, but that, that generally professional grade paints um, have more color variety. They offer more color within the professional grade than they do in the student grade. But stick with student grade for now. I mean, I, I would I use them interchangeably. I have plenty of both. Um, so there is a there's a question about um, what colors you use to paint the white cube, or what colors you recommend to paint the white cube. So the white cube will really depend on what you have sitting around it, because white is always the reflection of what it's near. So if you're going to paint a white cube outside, you're going to need cerulean blue to get the sky tint on the top. 
if there's grass nearby, you'll tint that. And, and it, that sounds crazy, but um, I was painting um, a block studies in a room down in Annapolis. And the, there, there was so much greenery trees outside of the windows that every single painting was tinted to the green. So we ended up laying a red, thin red film over those windows to balance out the green to get more neutral color. So it gets kooky like that. But that's to the point is that there are the outside colors will influence anything that you paint as white. The first time I made a white painting of a white bowl, I remember, I think it was one of the most in interesting points of my artist's career. And I remember looking at that white bowl thinking, I don't know how to even begin this. But as soon as you start, it's the difference between looking and seeing, you have to really get into your brain and, and tell yourself, I am, I am seeing a white bowl, but I'm actually seeing other colors. And the way to learn that is, if you take a piece of white paper and you kind of hold it up in the view of what you're looking at, like, like this, then you can see if this is white, then what is that? So you can keep a white card. You know what I mean? If you have one thing that is pure white, like a white card and you can kind of hold it in your view, you'll be able to line it up with what you're painting and you'll be able to see right away that it's probably purple or yellow or blue. And, and it's literally every color of the rainbow and white. I mean, you can, it really does depend on what it's near and what color it's picking up from what's around it. A bowl, I wouldn't do a bowl at first because the bowl has, I mean, all those curves of colors coming around. It's every color you can imagine. So start with a block or at least you've got big spaces of color. The blocks are good because you have a space of color. And so you can kind of just, you know, pick the color and make it. You might have some slight variation across the, the, the panel or the plane, but for the most part, it's not like it's a curve. That's why I said no sphere, because you're gonna get every variation of color as the, the object turns in space. All right, so um, we are definitely out of time, but maybe one more question or, um, and it's, do you recommend the same colors in acrylic that you do in oil? Yes, I do. I think you can mix the same way. You might get different reactions because of the, the chemical makeup or the, the, the way the pigment's based in, within the each, each uh, medium. Um, the, 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 the difference is, is the binder. The binder in, in acrylics is water and the binder in oils is oil. Um, and there's might be a little bit of a clay binder as well in the acrylic or some kind of um, other binder to keep the pigment together, but the colors will be, they're fairly the same. I would, in other words, even with crayons, I'll pull out my red, my yellow and my white and maybe a little purple to mix my flesh tones because it's the same mixture, no matter what, it doesn't change. The color mixture doesn't change, but the amounts might change that you put in each one and the, um, the type of red, like I'm not sure if the, the names are the same as across the board, but Flesh tones are flesh tones. And you know, every single human being has all different kinds of flesh tones, but we're all basically made up of the same basic colors, just variations of those colors. So don't go crazy trying to figure out, oh my gosh, this person has uh, the olive skin. This person's more yellow, this person's more red. So add more red, but it's always gonna be the same color mix up. African-American, everything. It's always gonna be like the same basic colors. You're just changing the variations of how they're mixed. The palette does not change. If you're looking for a quick way to, and this is the last thing I'll say, look quick way to practice that. Look at Chuck Close's work, the Bill Clinton portrait in our gallery. In that particular portrait, he's rather than mixing the colors to make the proper flesh tones in each space, he is stacking the colors. And so he breaks, it's, and in a lot of ways for learning flesh tones, it's a great way to break down the colors you would need to mix to make the flesh tones because he does it within each diamond space of Bill Clinton's face. And so it's a, it's a great way, it's called a perceived hue. You can kind of squint down like this and look at it, then open your eyes wide and squint down again, and you'll see how he's broken the colors up. So if you uh, wanna practice or learn, that's a great portrait to look at. Excellent, I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you everyone for coming to live drawn to figures. I've put the registration for um, the next two classes in the chat. Those two will be in May, I believe May 6th and May 27th. Um, yeah. So feel free to sign up. There is lots of room in those two classes. And thank you, Jill. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. It's good seeing you all.